as soon as we're born, three big things are facing us, aging, illness, death. We don't talk about that to little babies. They don't understand. But these things are facing them, and they face all of us at, at any point in life. And if our society gave a decent education, those would be the big issues they'd have us learn how to prepare for. But the values of society go elsewhere. And so if we want to face these problems, we have to take matters into our own hands. We come out to a place like this. You are set under the trees in the middle of the day, and you're face to face with your own mind. Because it's the mind that's going to determine when aging, illness, and death come, whether you're going to suffer or not. You need to get it under control. So this is what we're doing as we meditate, exerting some control over the mind. We don't just let it follow wherever it wants to go. You give it something good to focus on, like the breath, because the breath can be comfortable. And not only that, it's your guarantee that you're staying in the present moment, so you can watch the mind. You're not concerned about what you did in the past or what you're going to do in the future. They're there in the background, of course. Things you did in the past will be sending influences into the present moment, the random thoughts that pop up in the mind. And of course, as we're meditating, we're developing skills that we will need into the future. But first, you have to learn how to observe your mind and keep it directed where you want it to go. This can be one of the most dismaying parts of the meditation. You make up your mind you're going to stay with the breath, and then other things come in. And one of the first skills you have to learn is not everything that comes into the mind is worthy of attention. And things are not going to be perfectly quiet right from the start. So no matter what the mind is thinking about, in the background. Keep it in the background. As the texts say, you bring mindfulness to the fore. Mindfulness here means remembering what you're here for, trying to develop powers of concentration. And how do you do that? Well, mindfulness is part of it. Alertness, as you watch what you're doing, and you watch continually enough so that you can see the connections between what you're doing and the results you're getting. And that involves another quality, which is ardency. Mindfulness on its own can be mindful of anything. You can keep anything in mind. It still counts as mindfulness. Alertness can be alert to anything in the present moment. It's the ardency that makes them skillful. In a John Lee's analysis, it's the ardency that's the discernment factor among those three. Because if you're really wise, you realize that your actions are going to make the difference between happiness and pain. So you want to do everything you can to get the mind skillful, develop skillful qualities in the mind, so that they'll generate good thoughts, good words, good deeds. So you don't just let things drift around. And you're not here to be non-judging or choiceless in your awareness. There are stages in the meditation where you do try to be choiceless, but not at the beginning. In the beginning there are lots of choices. You're either going to stay with the breath or you're going to wander off. So you tell yourself to stay with the breath. If you have trouble staying with the breath, you might want to think about good reasons to stay with the breath first. Learn to talk to yourself, give yourself pep talks, encouraging you to see the importance of getting the mind trained.
and at the same time thinking of the, the drawbacks of getting involved in the world. So much of our culture is designed to make you feel bad about yourself so that you will buy something to make yourself feel better, which has nothing to do with your genuine well-being at all. Your genuine well-being comes from the mind. As the Buddha said, wisdom and discernment begin with the question, what when I do it will lead to my long-term welfare and happiness? What when I do it will lead to my long-term harm and suffering? So the emphasis is on your actions, because they make the difference. That's what's wise about those questions. That together with the realization that long-term happiness is possible, long-term suffering is possible. And you want the happiness. So the answer to that question, of course, is develop skillful qualities of the mind if you want to be happy, because they will then make it easier for you to do and say and think the right thing, the things that will be for your long-term well-being. So this is the wisdom of the Buddha's education, that what you do is important, and it doesn't depend on other people's opinion of what you're doing. Because aging, illness, and death, they don't care about other people's opinions. They don't care about your self-esteem or your lack of self-esteem, or how many toys you got. They present you with pain. They present you with difficulties. And as a lot of practitioners say, that's when the practice turns into performance, when it's tested. So you don't know exactly how hard your test is going to be. So you want to do your best so that your mind is well trained. So if it slips off the breath, you keep bringing it back. Try to talk to yourself in ways that give you encouragement. This is an important part of persistence on the path, patience on the path, because sometimes the results take time. You have to learn how to talk to yourself to keep your spirits up. There's a novel by Thomas Mann, Joseph and His Brothers. It's his retelling of the Joseph story from the Bible. And there's one part of the story where Joseph has been thrown in jail. And so he could have made himself miserable, but he decided to do something to, decided to do something to keep himself entertained. So he started interpreting his dreams, interpreting the dreams of his fellow prisoners. And he got really good at it. He started interpreting the dreams of the warden. And word came out from the pharaoh, he'd had a strange dream that nobody could interpret. So the warden sent Joseph to see if he could develop his skills. So instead of just being miserable with the hardships that he was undergoing, he found some ways to keep himself occupied, entertained, building on his strengths. So as you come to the meditation, realize you do have some strengths. Ask yourself what you've been good at in the past, what skills you've developed, and what lessons you learned about things like desire and laziness. How to talk to yourself that, so that your laziness doesn't get in the way. How to adjust your desire so that it's not too weak, not too strong. Too weak means you just don't put much effort in don't care. Too strong is all you're focused on is the, the results you want, and you're impatient. You have to learn to be meticulous in what you're doing, because training the mind is a matter of training something very delicate, very intricate. There's a passage in the canon where an elephant trainer comes to talk to the Buddha, and he says, with elephants it's easy. Take an elephant, you drive it from this city to the next city and then back, 
And in the course of that time, which is not long, you've learned all the tricks that that elephant is capable of. Whereas human beings, you can live together with someone else for years and still not know all the deceptions that that person is capable of. And you're faced with your own mind. It can be deceptive with you, too. So this is going to take a lot of your powers of observation, of all the skills that we can develop. This is the most challenging, but it's also the most rewarding. And it deals with the big issues that you're faced with. When the body ages, it doesn't ask your permission. And it doesn't ask you which parts of the body you're willing to have age first or stop functioning first. Your illnesses, you don't get to choose your illnesses. You don't get to choose your time of death or the way in which you're going to die. These things are thrust on you. And you have to be prepared, because if the mind is not trained, it can suffer a lot and make a lot of foolish decisions in the course of dealing with these problems. They will have results that will last not only in this lifetime, but also into future ones. So the skills you need to develop, and the primary ones are how to be with pain and not suffer from it, how to be with difficulties and not suffer from them. I've heard someone say that the cause of suffering is wanting things to be different from what they are. But that's not the case. There are certain things you have to accept, but you do want your mind to be different from what it is right now. You want it to develop skill. You want it to be more self-reliant. So you work on that. The mind has this ability to take the raw material that's coming in from the past and make all kinds of things out of it. This is what we're doing all the time. This is what our experience of the present moment is. There are the results of past actions coming in, and then there are our current actions. We're presented with raw materials. We get to choose which things that are appearing in the present moment that we're going to work with and which ones we're not. Which ones we're going to emphasize, which we're going to, we're going to de-emphasize. And we do it pretty willy-nilly. But as you meditate, you're learning to do it more systematically, more thoughtfully, with more insight as to which potentials right now are really worth developing, and which ones you just let go. The potential to be able to think about all kinds of things right now, that's there. The potential to develop concentration, mindfulness, other skillful qualities, that's there as well. So you do have to choose, and there's work to be done, important work, not the make work of society. Genuine work, solving a genuine problem. I mean, the Buddha sets up standards so that we will be up to the task. He wasn't the kind of teacher who'd say, well, just do whatever you want, and the fact that you participated will get you a star. You're saying these are difficult problems, but it is possible to solve them, but you have to work at developing the necessary skills. This is how you do it. He's a demanding teacher, but then again we're facing demanding problems. He teaches us how to be equal to them. That kind of education is the most necessary and the most valuable.
So try to encourage yourself to stick with it. Because it will see you through when aging comes, when illness comes, when death comes. You have the skills you'll need not to suffer, not to harm yourself, not to harm anybody else. And those are the most valuable skills you can develop. <laughs>